Thank you very much, uh, Professor Seo, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you to uh, the organizers for organizing this wonderful seminar. I hope not to take up too much of your time, as uh, I think all of you must be quite tired. So briefly, I'll just go through about highlight structures, uh, benign and malignant, and uh, basically ERCP is very important to help diagnose as well as to manage. Um, as you can see, uh, for the etiology, when we divide them to malignant, most of the time we're talking about cholangeal carcinoma, score bladder cancers, or even metastasis. And for benign, usually they're due to surgery, uh, usually post cholecystectomy post liver transplantation. And in the West, uh, mostly things which are benign like PSC. In some parts of the Far East, we have things like tuberculosis or parasitic infections. So I, when we go through benign biliary structures, um, what we usually mostly see are surgical injuries and post cholecystectomy accounts for about 80% of them. And the rates of this can be as high as about 0.5% of patients undergoing cholecystectomy. And for post liver transplant, it's about 5.9% of them will have hyalur structures. So when we talk about benign hyalur structures, uh, the original classification by Bismuth actually focuses on the level of healthy biliary mucosa to determine where they would to be anastomos. And so you can see here, uh, it's slightly different from the malignant one, whereby they don't have a type uh, 3A and 3B, but they just focus on uh, type 1, type 2 being more than 2 or less than 2 from the hilum. Type 3 going up to the ceiling, type 4 uh, destroying the confluence, and type 5, which is isolated right duct. So this is how the surgeons think when they are talking about uh, bismuth type strictures for benign disease in, the mind, in their mind, how they want to repair uh, the, the, the blurry injury. So when they did the studies in the early years by Costa Mania, they found that surgery had a very high morbidity of up to 50% or mortality as high as 13%. And this was mostly for all the hyalur strictures, they actually had worse outcomes. And therefore, uh, they felt that surgery was not the option and endoscopy was what was proposed. So endoscopy was found to be more safe and efficacious. And initial years, they just put in two plastic stents, about 10 French, and they kept them in for a duration of one month, uh, 12 months or one year, and they changed the stents every three monthly. Subsequently, uh, they began to be more aggressive and they actually put multiple plastic stents until this resolution of stricture. And they found an overall success rate of about 89% in one study. However, there was possibility of recurrence and they found that you know, if you keep putting stents, uh, if your range can go uh, all the way from one stand to six stands over a 12 month period to as high as 24 months. So we know that for biliary strictures, especially in the hilum, a lot of time it's due to hepatic artery injury. So if it's due to ischemic injury, we tend to have to work harder to kind of dilate and to stretch them out more because it takes time for remodeling of the biliary hilar stricture. So this is a case that I looked after. It's an open call cystectomy and there was a hepatic artery injury and patient had a bowel duct injury to the left main duct. And you can see this is post-surgery and uh, we injected the cholangiogram. And you can see the, there's actually a leak. At, on top of that, there's actually a tight uh, stricture on the left main. So the surgeon actually tried to suture over the left uh, main duct after repairing the hepatic artery injury and to actually dilate his uh, suture area uh, carefully before we actually put in a stent. Okay, so this is actually one of those classic cases whereby we uh, worry about because once there's a hepatic artery injury, we know that we will have problems. So this is a, a few months down the road after we went in again, you can see that the bowel duct has very irregular structures on the left. On the right, we couldn't get in. In fact, there was actually a leak on the right side. So we actually didn't attend to the right too much. We focused on dilating the left, okay? And uh, subsequently, you can see that there's still the stricture there. It's not getting better. And now this time around, you managed to find the right uh, using a balloon occlusion, okay? But despite that, uh, we still couldn't really get in. So we just dilated two uh, stands later into the left. So uh, and, uh, down. Okay, and can you hear you finally get into the right? We can actually use a Sohendra stand retriever to force open the stricture. But however, it was so tight that we could only put in a seven French stand and two tents on the right, on the left, sorry. Okay, so after that, you can still see the stricture takes a very long time to heal. Um, and this is what a typical ischemic biliary stricture looks like. And so at the end of this whole procedure, it took us about almost 18 months to two years before we could finally. Uh, remove all the stents. And um, despite that, this patient eventually still did require to uh, 
surgery because the strictures came back due to ischemia. So one thing to note, whenever you deal with benign biliary strictures, the ischemic injury, you have to be careful and watch out for problems down the road. Let's move on to malignant biliary strictures. Uh, we have the usual cholangeal carcinoma, carcinoma gallbladder or secondary uh, metastasis. And they also have the business classification, but it's slightly different now because we have the type 3A and 3B, which is actually talking about extension uh, into the right duct uh, for the 3A and extension to the left main duct for 3B. So the prognosis for hilar strictures is actually very poor, uh, less than 10% uh, survival of five years and less than 10% actually make it to curative resection. So the recommendation uh, for all our patients is we tend to do a staging CT scan or MRCP before we do stenting. Reason is that once you stand the patient, they actually affects the, uh, the images because there'll be uh, artifacts from your stent or uh, aerobilia or decompression of the ducts. The thing about uh, stenting, uh, do we do it before sending the patient to surgery? The answer is generally we try not to uh, unless there are indications such as cholangitis or the surgeon actually requests for stenting in this case, whereby we suspect that the patient has got a predicted uh, low liver volume uh, residual after resection. They want us to stand the, the, the liver lobe that's supposed to be left behind. And what they usually do is what they call portal vein embolization, whereby they, uh, for example, you want to keep the left lobe, you know, take out the whole of the right lobe. They will actually embolize the portal vein to the left lobe, and that will cause the left lobe hypertrophy and they will want us to put a biliary stand to the left lobe so that actually it prevents cholangitis because there's partial ischemia of that liver. So these are the kind of indications whereby we actually do preoperative biliary stenting prior to a hilar surgery. Um, for regards to PDBD versus ERCP, there's actually conflicting evidence. Some uh, studies show that there's actually similar, but in one study, they found that uh, post-operative morbidity was more frequent after PD versus ERCP for hilar strictures pre-surgery. Uh, one thing to note was that uh, they found that for patients going for PDB first, uh, before the surgery, you know, there's a slightly shorter survival and there's more often peritoneal mets, which were more frequent. Uh, and they suspected that this is due to the presence of multiple PDB catheters or indwelling stents that cross the peritoneum causing peritoneal metastasis. So I think that uh, this is something to consider with the surgeon. You know, if they are going for surgery and they want drainage, sometimes ERC may be better uh, from that perspective. So if you look at EHG recommendations, they don't suggest to go ahead to drain before surgery. And however, if they do want to drain before surgery, you should have a multidisciplinary setting um, to discuss which is the best modality. Let's focus now on palliative, which is the usual bread and butter for most of us. Like 90% of patients will not make it to surgery. And we talk about palliation of the higher structure, the surgical bypass, percutaneous or endoscopic. And likewise, from all the older data in the 1980s, high mortality for the palliation via surgery, and therefore endoscopy was actually proposed to be safer with low propensity for bowel leak infection. How about PDB versus ERCP? Uh, analysis actually shows that PDB tends to be more successful for ERCP for usually type 3 and type 4. However, adverse events were similar for both approaches. And in this study, they excluded all type 1 and type 2 because the type 1 and type 2 were all pushed towards ERCP. And therefore, uh, they were not put in this analysis. Of course, looking at all the Eastern data coming, especially from our Japanese colleagues, Korean colleagues, um, we see many of them trying out type 3s and type 4 successfully. But just to let uh, caution, I mean, we still always have to know that there's a limitation coming from below. And sometimes PTB may definitely have advantage for especially a type 4 structure. So if you look at the Western uh, guidelines, they actually recommend that palliative drainage uh, is mainly for type 1 and type 2 via ECP. And if it's type 3 and 4, you may want to consider PDB or combination with PDB and ERCP. And if you're a really expert, then maybe type 3 and 4 all the way you can do via ERCP. One thing to take note when you talk about uh, higher structure drainage, you want to basically drain the liver such that the glutamine drops by at least 50%. And you have to have at least a 33% normal liver uh, that you're draining. If you are dealing with a cirrhotic patient, let's say a patient with HCC, you need to drain more than 50% of the liver because uh, uh, the liver uh, that's left behind is, is not functioning so well. And another thing to take note, the more liver you drain, the less chance of patients having cholangitis and therefore longer survival. So take home point is, we need to do volumetric studies or you need to analyze uh, what the, the, the MRCP 
or, or the CD volumetry scan before you decide how you plan your high less than thing because you want to drain at least more than 50% most of the time. So therefore, same thing, uh, by guidelines from ESG, they suggest draining more than 50% and you try to do selective drainage. I mean, if you don't want to uh, drain a certain portion, don't opacify it. Okay, how about unilateral versus bilateral? Uh, two studies show that unilateral tends to have higher success rates, however, outcomes are similar. Uh, third analysis showed there's no difference for any outcomes. However, using uh, metal versus plastic, metal seems to have higher technical success rate and basically better overall 30 day mortality compared with unilateral versus bilateral stenting. So this is a, a, a more recent study and this is where they compared uh, basically from, uh, from the Koreans, uh, RCT comparing for uh, this one more than type two treated with metal stents. They actually found there was actually better if you do bilateral stenting uh, and it's better in terms of uh, fewer reinterventions as well as better stent patency. So in conclusion, the, the uh, bilateral versus uh, for stent versus bilateral plastic, plastic stents are less expensive, technically easy to insert, easy for removal and exchange, but however, they have limited patency. Metal stents have prolonged patency. Uh, they do not occlude side branches unless you use a fully covered. And also sometimes they may have easier passage due to relatively smaller delivery systems uh, because they are usually 8.5 French or even in more recent uh, years, six French uh, stands for the side-by-side -side metal stands. So when we talk about uh, SAMS, uh, stand dysfunction uh, was actually better with uh, uh, metal stands and it's actually more cost-effective in one uh, RCT. So this is an example I'll show you of a, a, a stenting of a, a hyalur stricture. Uh, this patient actually uh, was the first ERCP and basically we needed to get uh, uh, a diagnosis for the patient. And so therefore the initial stenting is uh, plastic stenting. And so you can see that uh, we actually opacified and you can see there's actually a very tight stricture. All right. And uh, you, you have to try to make sure you get a wire deep into the left and a wire deep into the right side. And subsequently you need to dilate because for the hyalur strictures, it's very tight. If you intend to put in two 10 French stents, uh, you need to dilate up both sides and uh, you have to make sure that uh, you can squeeze in both. Okay, one thing to make note that uh, if you put in plastic stents, uh, uh, what we normally do nowadays is to use retrieval plastic stents, which means that they come on a, on a delivery system that has got a, a lasso to it. And so if we need to downsize our stent, we actually can pull out the whole plastic stent together with our delivery system. We don't have to actually pull out uh, the delivery catheter and then pull out the stent after that. We can just pull out everything over the wire. So that's one advantage of uh, some plastic stents uh, like the Vanix, they have this lasso system. So you can see us putting out uh, uh, two plastic stents which are uh, going to the right and left loop. Okay. And uh, okay. So let's talk about side by side uh, uh, versus stand in stand for metal stent. That was plastic, not talking about metal. Uh, they actually show that there's equal outcomes both in terms of successful stem placement, drainage, early and late complications. And the choice of technique is actually at the discretion of endoscopists. Uh, based on the literature available, the side-by-side -side tends to be used more in the, in the West and the stand in stand more in Asian endoscopists. And um, however, with the advent of a better, uh, smaller delivery capital systems, side-by-side stem seems to become more easier these days. So if you actually look at the original side by side, uh, it started out with the Cook stands, then we have uh, the Boston stands, now we have the MI Tech Harono stands, and the diameter has gotten smaller all the way down to a 5.9 French, where you can put actually two side by side into the duodenal scope. One thing to note when you do a side by side uh, metal stand, you should try to cross the papilla or be at the same level if you can't cross the papilla because once you have an uneven stand, that means one is higher than the other, you tend to get blocked the one that's further down will block the one that's further up. You can't re-intervene if they get blocked. So this is actually a very nice study from our Korean colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Park uh, uh, and Professor Moon, Professor Seo and Professor Lee Sang-kyuk, you know, all those uh, famous professors have worked together to come up to decide which is better, stand in stand versus side by side. And uh, you can see over here, this is the image, you know, they're all experts and you can see they, they can do easily both the stand in stand method or just a side by side. And so uh, they found that basically there was actually no difference in, in any of the outcomes. And uh, therefore at the end of the day, the conclusion was that, you know, it's up to the preference of, of the 
the endoscopist. However, that's a non, uh, there's a trend that the patency was higher in the stand in stand group, but this was not statistically significant. So just to give you an example of a uh, stand in stand that we, we do we did also, uh, you can see that uh, we are actually taking out the old plastic stand and we we've left behind, and uh, then we are actually getting a Y in over the left side, balloon dilating up. Okay. And then once we put in uh, that's the wire to the other side, we have to find the other side. And that's the hard part, to actually find a wire on the right. You can see it's not so easy. The first part went to the cystic duct. Now we are searching and we can actually finally find the right side. So we actually put two wires, uh, one on the left, one on the right. And usually we try to stand the left first uh, because uh, it forms a nice uh, bend and that opens up the, the, the structures of the stand to allow us to go through the, to the right side. So you deploy the left stand and now you've put the right wire through the stand and we actually directly open the struts of the old uh, first stand and then we put in another stand. You can see that's actually a nice Y shape. Okay, and uh, this is another one, a side by side that we just done uh, just last week. Uh, you can see this is an MRCP uh, showing a patient with gallbladder cancer and it's causing a compression at, right at the hilum. We previously placed a plastic stand and now we took out the plastic stand and now you're putting the two wires in, you actually can see that you're putting out two very slim uh, Hanaro stands. Okay, you can see that they're very highly tapered, 5.9 French or 6 French, and they can be both put very smoothly through the duoscope. We have to keep it both equal. And you can see over here, there's a nice delivery system we unlock, and you have to watch closely both uh, procedures, uh, assistants actually have to deploy at the same time. And when you deploy at the same time, you must time it correctly such that both stands are deployed together because you do otherwise what will happen is that one will shoot in and the other one will not and you have actually a overlap at the bottom whereby it's not what you want and finally you can see that we are able to deploy everything nicely okay despite you know expert hands trying to deploy both there's still some unevenness sometimes and one may come out uh, open up first before the other as can be seen here but as long as both stands are exactly at the same site as you can see uh, over here they're perfectly at the same site uh, we know that in the future, we need to re intervene, it's actually much easier. Okay, so just uh, before I end on the side by side stand, just take note um, this uh, Hanaro stand is actually a braided stand and uh, it's uh, slightly different from the earlier stands, like from uh, Cook uh, and as well as the Boston Epic stand, which are actually laser cut. So I, I've used uh, the Silver uh, Cook laser cut, the Boston Epic laser cut, and the Hanaro braided. And I find that the laser cut is good because it's, uh, it's fixed in the sense that it does not shorten. But the problem is that when you deploy, it tends to jump. Whereas for the braided stands, like the Hanaro stands, uh, when we deploy, it actually doesn't jump, but there's actually a shortening effect. So you may have to constantly uh, readjust or recapture a bit here and there and jiggle it such that it, it keeps it in exactly in the right position. So I think uh, for those people who do bilateral side by side, take note uh, that uh, these are some things to take note, whether it's a laser cut or a braided. And also one thing which we found out uh, when we did this case recently, uh, the Hanaro stands cannot take the 035 wire. So you only can use the 025 wire for both sides, whereas for the other uh, laser cut stands, they allow 035. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, the natural high level uh, strictures, first thing is to differentiate whether they are benign and malignant. Second thing is to stage them properly uh, because you have to know whether it's the business one, two, three, or four. And every time you talk about drainage, you want at least 50% of the liver or more, whether it's preoperative or even for palliation. And when you talk about malignant strictures, I think everyone now feels that SAMS uh, or subsystem metal SAMS are superior. And uh, people are now realizing that bilateral SAMS may be better, even though the earlier data showed that unilateral may be enough. Why bilateral better? Because drainage is better and prevent cholangitis. So if you prevent cholangitis, you actually uh, may prolong survival. And back to the side-by-side -side versus stand and stand studies, uh, so far, no significant difference. And I think it's all based on the preference of the users and what they're comfortable with. And so with that, uh, thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Damian. Uh, it was a comprehensive uh, review on a HALA structure management strategy. If there is any question or a comment, please feel free start, to start. Uh, I think uh, uh, we can see all the faces together. Then we can discuss. 
like a round table discussion. I want to see you think you and also the Professor Lin and uh, Professor Ogura together. It's the organizer there. I think I'm not uh, controlling this Zoom, but okay. The, during your talk, Damian, uh, you mentioned about uh, you showed your, your own case of benign structure. Did the uh, plastic stenting and it was caused by hepatic artery injury and the ischemic injury. So a little bit resistant to plastic stent. Did you uh, ever thought about metal stent in those cases? Yes. Um, so that's the thing is, um, whenever we want to treat uh, benign structures of the hilum, um, I, I did consider metal, but uh, the problem is for the right, it was definitely too tight. Only a seven French uh, could go in and the duct was very uh, skinny. So you probably get a lot of uh, pressurization on the right. For the left, there was actually a uh, dilated left main, uh, but when you go beyond the left main to where segment two and three actually uh, uh, split, it was a very skinny duct. So uh, my fear was that if you put in a fully covered metal like uh, eight millimeter, you only have a short uh, segment that's actually to hold it up and may actually fall out. Uh, so. The problem for ischemic structures is that the ducts upstream are, are not very dilated like the, the, the malignant sort. So I did briefly consider, but I felt that I could not take the turn and, uh, and get around yeah. into the segment two to, to drop the stand there. How about your experience? Yes. Have you had hepatic artery injuries and you put it in fully covered? Fully covered. There are several uh, types of uh, short fully covered metal stands, which can be inserted for benign structures like a cafe stand or M highlight, it has waste in the stent, so designed to stay in the stricture segment. But a uh, real practice can be a little, little more complicated because upside was, if upside does not have enough space, the stent does not easily goes in and uh, frequently it pushes back into the distal part of the CVD. So as you mentioned, there is some difficulties. In your hospital, do you see, uh, I think uh, your surgeon also do operation for classic tumor, right? For bismuth right. type 3A, 3B, even 4? That's right. Uh, usually 4 is quite difficult. <laughs> yes, 4 yeah. is difficult. If you see uh, classic tumor with type 3A or 3B, with jaundice level, uh, bilirubin level of 15 milligram per deciliter, and will you do preoperative drainage or will you send the patient directly to surgery? You mentioned the preoperative biliary drainage is not routinely recommended. Yes, so that's the thing is, uh, it, we actually discuss everything in a multidisciplinary team. Uh, usually the surgeons um, are the ones that will decide how high the bilirubin they are comfortable with. Uh, if they are not comfortable, then they will want uh, some form of bilirubin drainage such that the bilirubin comes down before they operate. Um, uh, but if they are comfortable, they will actually go in straight for the surgery because they tell us that when we put our stents in, there's a lot of uh, contamination, infection, there's a lot of fibrosis. And, and likewise, even for the interventional radiologists, they also do have problems with bowel leak and contamination. So it's actually really a uh, case by case. Uh, so. In the earlier years, yes, we used to put in for our surgeons, but now our surgeons are, are more comfortable with high bilirubin before they operate. However, if they want to give, let's say, Y90, or they want to downstage with some chemo, um, or they, they actually uh, would then want bilirubin drainage most of the time, because once they give chemo or, or give uh, some form of radiation, patients get cholangitic very fast. Uh, so those are the ones that uh, we need to stand. And usually they will prefer internal drainage first because these patients will be... Uh, uh, going for a couple of months with chemo. I mean, in your experience uh, in, in uh, Asan, do you drain all preoperatively? In, or? in our hospital, uh, even for this type of structure, we started to drain when we first started ERCP, and we believed that it was necessary to drain the distal parts. But surgeons was not very happy with, uh, with the results. So uh, distal biliary structure in uh, may we you can send the patient directly to surgery, but uh, 
according to the endoscopist, there is a prep some endoscopists routinely do preoperative drainage. And also, frequently we need histologic diagnosis. For that, we need to do ERCP and uh, endobiliary biopsy. And after that, we routinely do uh, uh, drainage. When it goes to hyla structure, our surgeon insisted that uh, showed uh, not only our surgeon. When we go to surgeon's meeting, surgeons frequently say that preoperative biliary drainage is not necessary on their lecture. But the real happening in their own hospital was there is a lot of patients receiving preoperative drainage. So what I am uh, pointing is uh, the ideal, uh, the study or the results may not the same as the routine practice we are doing. So hyla structure for bismuth type 3A, the surgeons need to do liver resection and the remnant liver volume is not that many, uh, not that large. And if the remnant volume already jaundiced, then they are worried about the survival of the remnant liver. So for those cases, we are routinely doing preoperative drainage. Yes, uh, I agree. The surgeons yeah. will tell us which uh, lobe they want us to drain, but sometimes may not always be easy and because they say only drain the left and don't drain the right because they want to take out the whole of the right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, you think I can see your face, but I want a round table discussion, but uh, uh, you, uh, if I raise a question to you, Ting, uh, you yes. showed the complication case, intraperitoneal migration after yes. US guided HGS. Uh, it was very, very uh, educational case and we learned from your experience. You tried, uh, hybrid fixation of migrated stent, laparoscopic yes. and endoscopic. Do you think uh, it can be applied for future migration cases too? <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Professor So uh, your, your, your question, I think is uh, actually in this case, the patient uh, recovery quite quickly because mm. uh, he only just received the laparoscopic uh, surgery. So, uh, the patient is no uh, only one joint and uh, just live only uh, one to two days. So I think it's a uh, one uh, possible resolutions for these kinds of uh, in uh, stent internal migrations. Yes, yeah. but I think possible it's, solution. The, but the best way is the prevention of migration. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, right, right. right. But, uh, the, the one uh, important part is. Uh, the, the hole is very, uh, a very uh, become very small and it's very difficult to find in the gastroscope. So I yeah. think if uh, if you need to to do that kind of procedure, you need uh, very quickly to send patient to surgery. Yes. Yes, because as time goes, the gastric wall muscle shows contraction, so the right. Right. the puncture site will become very small. Yes. Yes. Can I ask uh, if the wire was still inside when it went in? Because some people say if the wire is still in, you can actually telescope another stand through to, to bridge. Was the wire in when it, it went in? Uh, actually, in this case, uh, we lost the uh, guy white. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so it's not, not a good, good thing. <laughs> yes. yeah. Professor Ogura? Uh, have you ever managed those kind of intraperitoneal migration? I thought you probably tried the uh, second stent insertion, right? Uh, I cannot see Professor Gura I think here. Professor Gura is not around, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, I think uh, we already used uh, the allotted time, so... We passed uh, 10, uh, 15 minutes more. So uh, it's time to say goodbye here. I think uh, uh, today we enjoyed uh, 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 several talks and uh, we, we have seen there has been a lot of progress in the field of US guided biliary drainage, hepatic gastro, uh, uh, 
hepatic duodenostomy and the pseudocyst and the necrosectomy and also high structure management strategy. We, ho I, we hope this uh, fourth HANARO webinar was very helpful and educational for all the participants. Now I'd like to close this session by thanking all the speakers and the participants.